Hello, everybody. It's August 3rd again, and that means we at the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation want to celebrate National Ernie Pyle Day with you. My name is Michael Brainerd. I'm an actor, producer, and a proud director of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation. 2023 has been a great year for Pyle fans. Just a short two months ago, Brave Men was re-released by Penguin Classics, Ernie's World War II masterpiece that encapsulates his Pulitzer Prize winning brilliance. Later in this video, you will see our presentation of this year's Ernie Pyle Legacy Award to a very special partner of our foundation responsible for publishing Brave Men. Before we get to that, we are honored to have a past recipient of the Legacy Award, David Christinger, a good friend of the foundation and esteemed author of The Soldier's Truth, a pointed account of Ernie Pyle's remarkable journey published by Penguin Random House on the same day as Brave Men. It is worth noting that David also wrote the foreword to Brave Men, infusing his personal connection and insights into his hero's own masterwork. So please join me now for a heartfelt discussion with author David Christinger, celebrating the legacy of Ernie Pyle. David, you wrote the foreword to uh, Brave Men, the mm -hmm. uh, Penguin Classics Brave Men that has been released uh, in, was it uh, May 30th? Yeah. So it's out there. Uh, and in your foreword, when you were talking about uh, the death of Captain Wasco, you used a, a, a portion of that in a couple of paragraphs. And you talked about that moment when his men were saying goodbye to him. And we all know it. <laughs> Most of the people that are listening to this probably have read it many times. But what you wrote after that quote uh, from... Wasco is that you wrote eight sentences, a grand total of 193 words, but only 94 unique words. The most learned language he uses is probably the verb uttered. And even that word was no doubt well understood by most of his readers at that time. There's also no passive voice, no long noun pr phrases, no late predicates or detached subjects. And there's and there isn't a single nominalization, all those clumsy writing crutches so many lesser writers unintentionally use that gum up their prose and raise doubts in the reader's minds about the sincerity and authenticity of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. As a writer and teacher of writing myself, I can attest that it takes great skill to deliver monosyllables in such a natural, pleasing and objective rhythm and Pyle was very clever, even if he didn't always believe that himself. I got to chill while you're reading that. Is that weird? <laughs> wow, that, David, <clears throat> you prove there, right there, that you are as good as our hero, our favorite writer. <laughs> well, I, I, I really appreciate that. That's, that's really kind of you to say. I am. Um, I, I think, um, you know, a lesson that I took away from Ernie um, was that when something is deathly serious, right, it's life and death, the writer doesn't have to do very much. The writer just has to tell the story and get out of the way, right? And that's what he did with Captain Moscow. When things aren't life and death, when they're a little more trivial, that's when the writer tricks can help, right? Right. And this was, again, something Ernie was so good at, you know, before the war, right? He wrote a column about getting his zipper stuck in his pants, right? You know, he he wrote about things that seemed trivial, but he wrote about them in a way where suddenly you realize that they weren't trivial or that... Oh, and they're like all of us. Right. And and that that ability to turn it on when he needed to and then, and then put it on a low simmer when that was called for, right? He, the Captain Waskow piece is so clear and concise that it's compelling, right? It's so clear and concise that it's compelling. Whereas someone else might have, you know, tried to evoke all these emotions and, and, and add descriptors and adjectives to everything that was being done, but that would have totally taken away from its power. Yeah. Wow. The um, so, what's your favorite part of Brave Men? 
Honestly, I um, I'm partial to the kind of transition from um, from when he decides to go to Anzio instead of going to England and getting ready for the invasion. And there's something about his reporting at that time where it's starting to, you know, he just did Captain Waskow. He's sort of broken new ground, but he still has that, that like, you know, um, I want to tell the truth of this thing, but I also want to help us win the war. Right. And, and he writes this, this, this uh, kind of reflection piece about Italy. And he's like, was it worth it? It has to be worth it. Otherwise, you know, otherwise we can't live with ourselves anymore. Right. Like otherwise we couldn't justify this anymore. And he, and he gets on that plane and he's flying over the Atlas mountains and, and he, and he's talking about how war is not beautiful, but sometimes there's beauty in war. And, you know, he's getting very philosophical and, I think he he that was like a kind of a breakthrough moment in in his writing um and then and then d-day right so it's like right, I, there's right. that transition there that i really appreciate so you mentioned that anzio uh, portion is one of your favorite uh parts of the book and then you also said normandy as well is there anything else that are uh, maybe a more obscure portion more obscure portion. Anything that stands out? Well, one Brain. one part of his reporting that that I started to see in a different light the more I I got into Ernie's story was the column that he wrote about the dying soldier in the tent in Sicily when he was he was there recovering from battle exhaustion, combat exhaustion. Um, I love his definition of that, by the way, where it's like too much sand, too much smoke, too much heat not enough food, not enough sleep, not enough water, you know, uh, and, and you're like, yeah, that would, that would grind anybody into dust eventually. Right. And, you know, this was something that the military had not acknowledged at the time. It took, you know, um, a couple years of study for the U S military to determine that the average combat soldier could last about 200 days in combat before they were totally ineffective anymore. And then you think, you know, Ernie spent, 28 months uh, in a combat zone and a year of that on the front line. So he's, he's a, you know, far surpassed what the average combat soldier saw likely. I mean, he's in obviously in a different role and, mm. and not experiencing everything that, that a combat soldier is, but pretty darn close. Um, mm. And so he's in, he's in Sicily, he's in a tent uh, medical tent and the orderlies bring in this man. His name's John. He's dying. They put him in the aisle. There's no room for him. Uh, the priest comes in, reads John his last rites, and Ernie writes that he says, I felt this compulsion to get out of bed and to kneel down next to him and hold his hand in his final moments on earth, right? And then he said, I didn't, because it didn't seem proper. Mm. And it didn't, it didn't seem like that was his place. And I'm sure there was that, that feeling that he had of am I a am I am an observer? Am I a participant? Am I um, going through the same things that these men are going through? What toll is it taking on me? Right, and and to me that was a, a hinge moment for him where suddenly he goes, you know what? I'm in it. This is this. I'm one of them. I I feel this on a level that I didn't feel before, and I realize I'm not a neutral observer anymore. And, and I, this is something that, you know, decades later, Sebastian Younger wrote about uh, in his war correspondence from Afghanistan, where, where he says, you can't be objective in a war zone. It's not possible. And anybody who says they're an objective observer is lying because you can't, you cannot stop yourself from identifying and, and becoming the thing that you are observing. Right. And, and so he has this deep regret, Ernie does, that he didn't comfort this man in his last moments. And then the man dies Ow. and he sort of hates himself for that. Yeah. And I think there's, there's, 
you know, that's part of the motivation for him, you know, when he gets to Italy and when he's in France, where he's not going to shy away from that stuff anymore. He's not going to, he's not going to say, Oh, I'm, I'm just over here, you know, and captain Moscow, I think is a great example of this where he doesn't, um, he doesn't participate in the, the ritual, the, the, the saying goodbye, but he observes it and he captures it in such detail that it feels like he's experiencing it. And it feels like we're experiencing it and we're watching it in that real time. And, and I don't know, I, I don't think he writes Captain Moscow the way he writes it without that experience in Sicily. Yeah. That was, yeah. that for me was just had, as soon as I read it, I thought there's something here. This is a, this is a hinge moment for him. So, so, you know, part, partly I had a interviewer ask me, they said, you know, kind of, you know, tongue in cheek said, why does Ernie Pyle still matter today? And I said, the first thing that came to mind was he forever changed the way we cover war. Plain and simple. There was a before Ernie Pyle and then there was an after Ernie Pyle. And no one after Ernie Pyle could ever imagine reporting on a war without going to the front lines and, and being in the dirt, in the mud for that worm's eye view right? That's the way it's done. Um, Ernie set that tone. Ernie changed things um, because he was so unbelievably good at it and popular. It would be like, um, you know, what's a good example? Like, you know, watching Michael Jordan, right? And play basketball and saying, oh, you know, that fadeaway jumper, that works pretty good. I'm going to, I'm going to try to learn the fadeaway jumper. That's how other writers looked at Ernie. It's like, oh, what's he doing that makes him so good? How can I do that? And there were lots of imitators, um, you know, but nobody did it as well as he did. Uh, But I lost track. I lost track of how many correspondents that I had interviewed for the book who said, oh, I became a war correspondent because of Ernie Pyle. Mm -hmm. Well, David, thank you for being here today. And I want to tell you, happy National Ernie Pyle Day. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, It's one I look forward to every year, honestly. It's great because uh, you certainly do um, uh, carry the spirit of Ernie uh, with your own writing. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. I can assure you that was a lot of fun for two Ernie Pyle fanatics. Thank you, David, for your insight. Good luck with your book, The Soldier's Truth. And thank you for helping us with the fine crafting of your forward to brave men. And now I would like to pass the microphone over to my friend and fellow Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation Director, Steve Machineau, with our special award presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Machineau. I'm on the board of the Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation, and I'm here with John Siciliano. And today, August 3rd of 2023, the foundation is so proud to award you, John, and Penguin Classics the 2022 Ernie Powell Legacy Award. Your help in releasing Ernie's Brave Men on May 30th of this year shares Ernie's love for the personal storytelling style of journalism. Thanks very much, Steve. It's really been very gratifying to work with you and Jerry and Mike and the whole board of the Ernie Powell Legacy Foundation to bring Brave Men to the attention of a new generation and to honor Ernie Pyle by publishing him in the Penguin Classics, where he joins the ranks of John Steinbeck, Siegfried Sassoon, Ernst Younger, Winston Churchill, John Dos Passos, Ernest Hemingway, and other greats. And it's been especially gratifying as the grandson of a World War II veteran to publish Ernie Pyle. My grandfather turns 96 tomorrow, and he's been in and out of the hospital for the last couple of months. Every week, my grandmother emails me to let me know what books she's been reading about in her newspaper, Long Island's Newsday. And while I'm usually aware of the books, it always kills me a little to have to say to her, no, Graham, I didn't publish that one. That one was published by a different publishing house, or that one was actually published by the colleague a few doors down from me. But last month, my grandmother sent me an email all about Ernie Pyle. 
She had read the Minneapolis Star Tribune piece that was syndicated in Newsday about, quote, the most famous war correspondent of all time. And I was elated to be able to say to her, finally, that's my book. I worked on that book. She said that she grew up reading Pyle, that everyone read him. A couple of weeks ago, I brought a copy of Brave Men, which I've got right here, to the hospital. And when I showed it to my grandfather, whom I was having, having trouble keeping interested in anything, even ice cream, his eyes lit up and he said approvingly, Ernie Pyle. And I could see him look in his mind's eye, thinking back more than 80 years to when he was in his late teens and serving in the Navy. So thank you for the opportunity to connect with my grandfather in this way and for the excellent work you do year in and year out to keep Ernie Pyle in our hearts and minds. It was David Christender's New York Times Magazine essay. Uh, I think it was on the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Um, that was a very widely read piece and i i read it along with a lot of other people and that's what awakened me uh to you know this idea of publishing ernie pile and penguin classics i later discovered that david had been signed up by a colleague of mine at a sister imprint penguin press uh to write a biography of, of ernie pile and i thought well that's the perfect opportunity for us to reissue brave men so you know, I tracked down the rights. It took some doing uh, because, you know, I think the book was originally published by Henry Holt and Company. And, and then there was an edition available from, I think it was the University of Minnesota Press. Is that right? Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I had to do a lot of uh, sleuthing uh, to get the rights. It turned out the, the University of Minnesota Press for some 20 years of publishing the book uh, without the rights to do so. Um, so we were able to, you know, the Pyle Foundation was able to claw back the rights um, or to, you know, issue a cease and desist order to Minnesota and offer me the chance to make an offer on the book. Um, and uh, yeah, and that, and, you know, once that was worked out, it took a lot of doing, but I was, I was determined to make it happen because I thought, you know, this is a great book for Penguin Classics and, and readers today really need to know about Ernie Pyle. Um, and then, you know, we coordinated with our colleagues at Penguin Press. We published it, published Brave Men on the exact same day uh, as David Christinger's bio came out, the uh, Soldier's Truth. And, you know, we, we saw this media blitz uh, for Ernie Pyle uh, tying into Memorial Day and Father's Day and the anniversary of D-Day, it all hit perfectly. And, uh, you know, within a week, we had sold close to a thousand copies on, on Amazon. Uh, it shot up into the, into the, you know, uh, low digits in terms of its uh, Amazon rank. Uh, and it was, a, a, you know, a Penguin classic that has sold with unusual velocity, um, thanks to this kind of, uh, this, this media blitz. Um, so it's off to a great start and, you know, we're looking forward to putting it into the hands of, of new readers all around the country, all around the world, um, getting it assigned in classes and, um, you know, just doing what we do at Penguin Classics, um, uh, to put it in the company of, of, like I said, the other greats of, of, of war literature and world literature. Great. Well, thank you, John. You know, the foundation had such a great time being included in that process for the release, you know, and working on the on the cover image and the photos used. And so we, we thank you so much. Again, thank you from all of us at the Ernie Powell Legacy Foundation and congratulations on this year's Legacy Award. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. And once again, congratulations to John Siciliano and Penguin Classics for their roles in promoting the life and work of the great Ernie Pyle. The Ernie Pyle Legacy Foundation is proud to wish you and your family another happy National Ernie Pyle Day. Make sure to visit all of our social media pages and our website, erniepilefoundation.org. Thank you.